gentlemen, thank you for your patience this morning. First of all, let me generally inform everyone here that this is a court of law. I expect res respect from everyone here to everyone else here in this courtroom today. Uh, we're here under the rule of law, which requires that respect. Uh, therefore, any outbursts, anyone speaking out of turn will be asked to leave immediately. I don't want to do that, but that will be necessary. Uh, the deputies have been instructed also to arrest anybody who gets out of order. Uh, so please, let's not have that happen today. Let's be respectful, consider the rule of law, and uh, proceed with this matter. On the record now, we're here at open court. It is the court's 
criminal docket. This is case 623164. It's entitled State of Ohio versus LaCynthia A. Tidmore. Present in court is Ms. Tidmore, is that correct? Yes. Also present representing Ms. Tidmore, her attorney, Mr. Thomas M. Shaughnessy. Present representing State of Ohio Assistant County Prosecutor Anna Faralia, Ms. Jennifer King. We're set for sentencing today on a prior day in court. This defendant entered a guilty plea. In count one, aggravated vehicular homicide, a felony of the third degree. In count two, uh, failure to stop after an accident, a uh, felony of the third degree. The court has <coughs> ordered a pre-sentence investigative report, uh, also uh, ordered and received a mitigation penalty report. Well, there's been a mental health eligibility report, which uh, dealt with defendant's mental health. I've reviewed those reports. Mr. Shaughnessy, the chance to look at those as well? Yes, Your Honor. Is there any additions or deletions to information there? No, Your Honor. I've also received status updates with respect to pretrial uh, supervision of this defendant, and I've reviewed those. Have you reviewed those as well, Mr. Shaughnessy? Yes, Your Honor. And uh, Ms. Feralia, have you seen these as well? Yes, Your Honor. Uh, okay. Uh, would you like to address court mitigation? Thank you, Your Honor. On behalf of Ms. Tidmore, Your Honor, first I want to say that what I'm about to say is not meant to demean the seriousness of this situation. We know there was a life lost here, and it's tragic, Your Honor. And nothing we can say can change that, can make it okay, or any better. But at this stage of the proceedings, Your Honor, uh, we also do feel that the court needs to consider some things about LaCynthia. Your Honor, she is uh, 23 years old. She has taken responsibility in this case. She entered a plea of guilt. Uh, criminal activity in general is uncharacteristic for her. She has almost no criminal record, Your Honor. On the day in question, she did not wake up intending to commit any crimes. She was on her way to work like any other day when this unfortunate situation occurred. Your Honor, she never wanted to hurt anyone, and I know when she gets the opportunity to address the court, she's going to apologize. So, Your Honor, we'd ask the court to take all this into consideration when determining a sentence today. Thank you. Ms. Tidmore, what would you like to tell the court? Well, I'm, I'm sorry that everything happened how it happened. Like, I regret the day. I wish I could go back and redo it if I could. I mean, um, I'm sorry about the life that I took. And it hasn't just changed the family life, but it changed my life. Like, completely. Um, it's like I'm 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 really I'm really 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 sorry about everything like everything. It's it's some things that I wish I could could go back and redo differently. And I'm truly sorry. All right, Ms. Bryant. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, the victim's family is here, and they would like to address support. Um, the victim's mother and um, I believe her aunt and her cousin are going to address you. I also have some letters from the father and the grandmother that I will read to you. Um, the state is going to call up Altia Luster. A-L-T-I-A. -A. Um, Your Honor, I want to say I do not believe that she is sorry for what she did because she could have stopped. She could have stopped and made sure that she didn't hit a kid or a dog or a cat or a rock or anything, but she didn't. I had the unfortunate opportunity to see this car right after she hit her at a gas station that I frequent every day. She had a conversation with one of my friends that works in the gas station and at no time did my friend say she ever, never even knew. They laughed. 
They joked she paid for gas and asked her not to call the police and have her car towed. And when I got there, I saw the police processing this car. And that's something that I have to live with every day because I held that baby. You know, and every time she looked at me, she smiled all the time. She had so much life in her. She wanted to do stuff, and she loved her mother. And now she don't have that no more. And no matter how much time this girl get, she gonna get to come out and be with her kid, or kids, or her family, or whatever. My niece don't have that no more. Desire was an only child. And she's going to be missed by us. And she was loved by us. And she had family that cared about her and cared about everything she did and about everything that she was going to be. I pray for my niece every day because she is struggling right now. It's a lot of days she wake up and she don't want to be here. What are we supposed to do? How can we help her with this? It's nothing that I can say that's going to help her. And I buried two of my kids back to back. So I know how she feel. But I don't know that feeling that she feel. And I wouldn't wish that on nobody. Her words mean nothing to me. Nothing to me. Just by her the way she stand here and it's nothing it's nothing not a tear shed you don't feel bad about anything it's just unfortunate that you got caught that's where the where it's, where it's, they're angry at now is because she got caught but what about us what about desire's family you know, what about her mother and how she's going to have to spend the rest of her life trying to deal with somebody that was texting and driving when you should have been paying attention because honestly, she could, she didn't have to be the only kid. It was more kids out there that morning. She could have had two or three kids and she still would have kept going. So I'm begging you to please Take into consideration how we feel and how my niece feels and what she's going through right now because it's not going to end for her. Thank you. Siobhan Smith. Good morning. Can you please spell your name and let the record for you? S-I-O, B as in boy, H-A-N. Your Honor, I do not feel that LaCynthia is remorseful not one bit. That day that she hit desire, not one time did she stop. She had people behind her blowing, telling her, you are about to hit a child. Not one time did she slow down, put her phone down, nothing. She knew that she hit a child. I was at the hospital that morning. I got a phone call at work. I left work to go to the hospital to be with her. She made a phone call to her family, her sister, knowingly that she hit desire. And told her sister this. Knowingly went to work and called a ride to go to work. She had no intentions on turning herself in. She had no intentions on stopping. She had no intentions on being caught with this accident. Not one time do I feel she is remorseful at all. Nobody, it's, nobody hits somebody saying that they hit a cone and don't stop. I don't care if you hit a rock. You're going to stop to see if something is wrong with your car. You knew something was wrong with your car. You had a whole piece of your car missing. You can't possibly tell me that you driving like that, not knowing that something is going on. She changed lives that day. Not one life, she changed lives that day. That day, my desire was supposed to be with me for that weekend. I had to wake up that next day explaining to my kids where was desire, why desire is not coming over. 
Do you know how hard it is to explain to kids that they're not coming back at all? Not one time did she just out here living her life on social media, gallivanting around, around like there's a part, like everything is okay. There's nothing okay about this situation at all. You should not be able to be on social media and thinking that this is a joke and a game. And then you get mad. No, we, you act like we're bothering you, that we disrupted your life. You disrupted our lives. It's not fair to her mother. It's not fair that she should have to go through this, spend her holidays, birthdays, not having her child there at all. But it was okay for you to call and let people know what you did and then turn around and act like you didn't know what you did. You knew exactly what you did. So I feel that she should get time in jail. I don't feel that she should see her kids. If she see her kids, I feel like she should have to see her kids behind bars. I don't feel like she should be getting any privileges. This house arrest has done nothing for her at all. This whole time she's been on house arrest, she's been running the streets, on social media, just living. Not one time did she act like she was sorry. You don't laugh in a mother's face like it's okay. It's not a joke and it's not a game. And Ms. Twyla Austin Williamson is going to address you. Just tell your first thing about the Twyla, T W Y O A. Desire of Merit Mays, wonderful little girl. She affected a lot of people's lives. She was a straight A student. She loved school. She loved to dance. She loved to sing. She was very respectful and very mature for her age. I was very hard on her because I know how society is. At the age of nine, she didn't know how to cook. She could clean. She could wash dishes. She was so excited to turn 10 because we had this big party planned for her. She was not playing in the street. She was crossing the street to go to her bus stop. We live on Babbitt. I don't understand what I am going through. I am seeing a psychiatrist. I am on three different medications. I tried to kill myself. This is just so unfair. And I would have some type of sim sympathy for Lucynthia if she just would have stopped. The accident had already happened. She broke my daughter's neck. That is how my daughter died. She died on the scene. She was in the hospital for 15 days because I couldn't let her go. When she, they caught this dead on arrival me, she died at the scene. She broke both of my daughter's femurs. She slashed from the inside out, she broke every bone in my daughter's face. Every tooth in the front of her face was gone. Her chin was split wide open. Her eyes was bulging out of her head. Her neck was broken. You had to be speeding. No way you was doing 30 miles. It's Seven o'clock in the morning. My daughter leaves out the house at 6.53. Her father leaves right before her. I work night shift. We practice this all whole week. So I know my daughter knew how to cross the streets. 
a whole week before this happened. This was the first day that I let her go anywhere by herself. And so y'all don't understand the type of mother that I am. I stopped my life for my daughter. And my whole life for my child. She was a good kid. And everybody said that she crossed loved her the school st stopped for all the kids to go to her funeral this is not fair to me as a driver you are obligated to pay attention not only your license was suspended when you were driving to begin with you didn't even have insurance I don't have no money. I'm an STNA. I won't work my butt off. I don't get child support. I don't get anything. I never went to child support. I took the responsibility once I left her father. That was that. And I raised my daughter for eight years by myself with the support of these people that you see. These are not just people just coming out the woodwork. These are people who know Desire, who loves Desire, who was in her life. She had nine birthdays, and my cousin was at every last birthday. Her kids was at every last birthday. They don't have that anymore. I can't hold my daughter. I can't yell at her. I can't put her on punishment. I don't have any more kids. And for you to just disregard, you knew what you did, how your tire fell off, your bumper was off. A cone not going to do that. I don't care that it was construction a little couple of minutes. A cone wouldn't have done that. A car was, a RTA Transit was behind her and blew because they seen my daughter. How you didn't see her. So you that into your phone. Somebody's behind you blowing, warning you that you finna hit my child. You killed her on the scene. There was no tire marks in the streets. You kept going. Then you call either your mother, your sister, I don't know who you called, but you called for a ride. You went into the gas station. You paid $10 for gas. You was on the phone calling a tow truck. And you took your butt to work. Like my daughter was not nothing. How didn't you know when you hit something, boom, 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 you're not going to look up and look in your rearview mirror. My daughter hit your windshield. You didn't see that my daughter was 70 pounds. You didn't feel that? You didn't run her over. You hit her and she flew. And she hit the curb and broke her neck. My daughter's eyes was protruding out of her face. She was lifeless. They gave her that shot for her heart to start beating. That's why I had her for 15 days. Two extra days because I decided to save another child's life and donated her organs. I wear my daughter ashes around my neck. That's not something. My daughter's birthday is coming up. She gets to see her children. Not only that, Monday, this is why my eye is like this. Why did I even have to cross paths with her at Audie's when I live on Babbitt? Why is she tormenting me like I killed her child? If you was paying attention, this would have never happened. Period. And then for you to be me and me talking about some you don't want no wreck. I, don't, I didn't even know that was her. I don't go following her. My family's not tormenting her. If we, excuse me, if we wanted to retaliate, we could have. Her records are, are open. It's public records. I did it the right way and I did it by the law and it still didn't go as planned. Why do she have the leisure to still go to work? To still see her children, to still live, to be on sisters, this old man group on Facebook arguing of her boyfriend that kicked me in my face. How are you sorry? When you see me in the grocery store, you should have turned around and walked out. You didn't do that. You said you don't want no wreck. I didn't 
didn't even know this was her. I'm not paying her no attention. I'm in a grocery store. I don't even go to the grocery store. I just so happen to do that. I don't do anything. I haven't worked. I haven't done nothing. But I have to sit here and look at this woman who killed my daughter and she laughed in my face like it was a joke. How is that sorry? If I was her, if you didn't walk away, at least you could have been like, Twy, I know you know my name because you clearly know my face. So you could have been like, I'm sorry, Twy. No, you could have gave me a hug. You could have came to the hospital. I'm not that type of person. You did none of that. I would have had some type of compassion in because you are a mother, because you are young. So I would have had some compassion for you, some type of sympathy for you. But you just disregard him. You're not sorry. You pleading guilty to make a show. This is a show for her. Because when we came to court April 9th, she stood right there and right here. And when you said, willingly knowing that you hit a child, she looked at her lawyer and said, I don't know, I hit her. How did you know? You might not have known initially because you were texting. But once my, that car hit my daughter, you knew. You didn't run her over. She fell on the top of your car, rolled over your windshield. Your car was undrivable, but you kept going to, you made it to 185th gas station. You went to work. You had no intentions on turning yourself in. The only reason why you turned yourself in is because the lady that was at the scene followed you to the gas station and called Euclid Port Lease. That's why. I don't owe you anything. I don't want no apology because you should have apologized at the scene and I would have been way more lenient. She needs to get the max that she can get consecutively. Whatever that is, one to three, one to five, that's eight years. You really need to get more than that. Because when you see me in the grocery store, how are you sorry? How can you change the hands of times when you initiated the fight? How is that sorry? That's not sorry. When you see me, I didn't see you. So when you see me, you should have walked away. You shouldn't have been coming talking about some I don't want no wreck. You got the wrong one. Because I could have retaliated. I didn't. I could have went to your mama house. I could have went to your sister house. I didn't do none of that. I let the law handle it in the honor of my daughter. Because I know my daughter won't want me behind bars. The type of mother that I am, I don't play no games about my daughter. My daughter is very respectful. You can ask any teacher, anybody. She's not one of these little bad, rowdy kids. She's not like that. And even if she was, she still don't deserve to die. She can't bring my daughter back because of the injuries that she sustained. And I get that. What I'm saying is, as a human, as a mother, because what type of mother are you? You probably don't even got custody of your kids. So what type of mother, you have children of your own, will keep going? Once you hit her, you should have stopped. You could have been at the hospital praying with us. You could have gave me a hug. You could have said, I'm sorry. And I would have took that. And I would have prayed with her. But you didn't do that. Then you want to talk about you incompetent. How are you incompetent but you steady on the internet? Your sister make a Facebook post just after this happened. Calling people. Talking about they beat me up at Audis. Y'all don't know who know who. Cleveland is big but it's small. You're on Facebook writing statuses about who coming to court with us. So what y'all going to do at court? This sorry that she's saying, she's not sorry. This is all a show. Because somebody that's sorry, when she seen me in that grocery store, first of all, there's no contact, so she should have left. And why is she driving? Why is, she, why is she driving? She drove away. Why are you tormenting me? I didn't kill your children. You killed my daughter. You sit up here, playing on your phone, playing in your pocket, all blue on your hair like that. You should be in this courtroom crying. You should be remorseful. You should have some empathy as a mother to mother. She don't have no empathy. She doesn't have no sympathy. She doesn't have no morals. And she really do not care. And that's how I honestly, truly 
fail. But if she would have came at me a different type of way, I probably would be on her side saying, be lenient. I can't do that for with a person like that. No way in hell can I pray for her. I can't. I would have. All she had to do was stop. Or instead of calling a ride to pick her up from the gas station, she could have called the police. Clearly she got a cell phone, right? Because she texting and driving, right? So you didn't even call the police. You just disregard who hit somebody and don't look in their rearview mirror. Or who hit something and not look up. So I'm just asking you, I'm begging you, parent to parent, it's unacceptable. Nobody understand how I feel. Like, I don't, I don't even know what else to say. Like, she needs to get the max that she can get. Because if she would have came at it a whole different way, I would be right with her, praying for her, and asking you not to give her the max. I even would have changed my story, but once Monday happened, I know she is not sorry. Period. Her and her boyfriend and her sister jumped me. How are you sorry? Thank you. Your Honor, there are some other family members that are not able to be here. So um, I have provided the court with the letters and they wanted me to read this in open court. The first letter is from her grandmother and it says, Honorable Judge Corrigan, good morning. My name is Mrs. Mays, Desire's grandmother. I'm sorry I could not come due to a recent surgery, but please let Ms. Tidmore know that I can't forget her due to the fact that you hit my granddaughter and left her there to die. Why? You went to the park, you went to park your car, you left the scene of the accident, you went to work. May 5th to 6th days later, your conscience was tearing you apart as to where you couldn't perform your job duties. That was God saying to you, you realize you hit this child and left. Well, while you left, Desire was fighting for her life all the way up to November 21st, 2017. That's when she got tired of fighting and God came to take Desire home with him. She never had a chance to grow old with her family, especially her sister and brothers. You're such a coward. It was hard for the family, especially her mom and dad. You were definitely a coward. Maybe if you would stop to help Desire, she would still be here. It's sad to say whatever sentence is handed down to you, you're going to do, then get out to be with your kids. Desire's mom and dad and stepdad will never see her again. The entire family, my heart aches every single day for your actions of being a coward. May God have mercy on your soul. You need to turn to Desire's mother and apologize to her deeply. Glory to God. This is Mays. This is for from, I believe it's a child, Your Honor. It's Larry Mays. And it says, Honorable Judge Corgan, what I feel about the situation is that she is probably, that she is probably, that she wasn't probably paying attention because if she was, it would never have happened and Desire would still be here. I miss Desire. I think about her every day, but I smile and I try and keep a smile, but sometimes it's hard to smile after you lose someone you love. But I just sit back and think about the good times we had so I can feel like she's standing right next to me. I feel sad, but there's nothing I can do because she's already gone and with God, and I can't bring her back to life. I remember when we were playing with the dolls and a whole bunch of stuff that comes with playing with dolls, and we talked to them, we took them everywhere, and we acted 
like we went out to eat and with them and it was funny. When she got her phone, we were sitting next to each other and we didn't stop laughing for the whole night. One day, her and my brother was trying to teach me how to drive on the game and, I, and it was not working out because I was turning the controller too many times. I thought the car was going to move, but it never, but it never did. So they were laughing at me, and I remember desire always laughing. And the last one, Your Honor, is from Desire's father. <clears throat> if it may please this court, my name is Lariat Mays, and I am Desire Mays' father. This has really, this has been really hard to digest. Desire was at my house two to three weeks before she was taken away from her big sister, two big brothers, and three little brothers. That's truly missing her, and it still bothers them to this day, and the family and friends. Can you in the courtroom today imagine how I felt after being awakened out of my sleep with the news that my daughter was run over by a car on her way to school? I jumped out of bed in a panic put on my clothes as fast as I could, I jumped in my car and drove to the hospital. That was the longest drive of my life. I was wondering what happened, how this happened, why her, and I even started praying to God that my baby was okay. I was thinking those thoughts that made me angry, but yet made my tears form from the fear of the worst. I get to the hospital and the worst is happening. My daughter is on life support, holding on for her life. The only thing that is saving her is a machine. Seeing desire in the hospital bed made me think really hard about the type of father I was to her. I again asked God why, and then started to be honest with myself about the type of father I was. I wasn't the best father to her, but we were starting to build a relationship. I was able to see her the day after her birthday, and we enjoyed being around each other. To my surprise, she asked me to take her to the father-daughter walk at her school. To be honest, I teared up because my daughter was really allowing me to grow a relationship with her, but now she's gone. She's gone, and I will never have the chance to build that father-daughter relationship. Desire was taken from her family by a remorseless Cynthia Tidmore. Miss Tidmore has no sympathy for my daughter. I still jump up in fear when my phone rings early in the morning. I still see Desire in the hospital bed, <coughs> suffering, breathing from a machine. Desire was a victim of a hit and run and then left for dead. Desire, my baby, was a nine-year-old little girl trying to go to school and receive an education. She was trying to make something out of herself. My daughter was loved by so many and had such a bright future. Now all we can do is wonder. Wonder if the tragedy never happened. Wonder if Desire would have liked the new song on the radio. Wonder if she would have gotten straight A's on a report card. Or even wonder if she, have, if she would have <coughs> went to the big school dance. Yeah, I skipped years. But thanks to Miss Tidmore, my family can never wonder. There is no reality for our question. She was taken. I would also like to say I'm sorry to her mother, Miss Twyla Austin. I know I haven't been the best, and I know we don't see eye to eye on nothing at all. We do agree that we both love desire, and we agree that Miss Tidmore deserves a very harsh to max punishment for her heartless crime. I also believe that Desire has been watching over both of us and would love if her mom and I can find an equal sense of peace. Thank you, Your Honor, and thanks to the ladies and gentlemen that came to the courtroom to represent my daughter. My name is Larry Mays, the father of Desire, and as an entire family, we pray for her justice. Your Honor, on behalf of the state of Ohio, the principles and purposes of sentencing are to punish the offender and protect the public. 
these cases are always the most tragic cases when a child's <coughs> life is lost. The tragedy here is that Ms. Tidmore didn't stop. She didn't render any aid. And she proceeded on her, her daily activities. And for that, she will have to pay for that through her sentence. And I agree with Ms. Austin. When she stopped at the gas station, she saw the condition of her vehicle, and she saw the, matter, the brain matter that was on the vehicle. As a result of that, again, she will have to pay for her actions. And the state of Ohio would respectfully request that you impose the sentence that is commiserate with this crime, Your Honor, keeping all things equal. She was a nine-year-old little girl who had a lot to offer in this community. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anything else? No, Your Honor, thank you. All right, the court has considered all this information, all the principles and purposes of felony sentencing, all the appropriate recidivism and seriousness factors, and these cases are always tragic. When a life is lost, there's never a good reason. Uh, there's never sense that can be found in what happened. It's always senseless. Uh, when, it, when the death is a child, it's even more, more hurtful, more tragic, uh, because of all the things that could have been. Uh, we can't live in a world of could have beens. We're, we're here with what's occurred. And uh, I completely understand how the hearts of the family members of desire are hardened with vengefulness and retribution, hatefulness, uh, because of your actions, because of what you did. Because you didn't stop. And, uh, and you can see how it's so easy to read in all kinds of things in your mind because you didn't stop, because of your actions that day, because you walked away from your car after you saw the type of damage that was on your vehicle. Uh, and uh, this court can only hope that the family can replace those hardened hearts over time with uh, memories of the joy, of desire, and the time he had, and to find some other higher purpose, some other higher purpose that can bring some good to some part of your family, your community. It's not going to happen today, tomorrow. It's going to take time. And that, that's the only hope I can provide to the family. The law is completely inadequate. There is no, there's no way the law can replace a life. It's just, it's inadequate. There's nothing we can do. The legislature has determined what kind of consequences should follow when this type of act is committed. Uh, and I'm going to follow that legislative guidance that's all I can do. That's all I can do. Uh, this case and your actions and the way you've comported yourself during this case uh, tends to show me that the family's correct, that, that you don't have real remorse. Okay. And that uh, consecutive sentences are necessary to punish you, to punish you. And it, it is not disproportionate to what you did in this case. And I'm further finding that the harm in this matter is so great or unusual that a single term just is not adequate to reflect the seriousness of what you did. Based on all the facts of this case, Incorporating the information from the pre-sentence investigative report uh, and uh, your conduct on that day. 
Therefore, I will impose consecutive sentences. In count one, the aggra aggravated vehicular homicide, it's a felony in the third degree, five years at the higher form of torture for women. In count two, failing to stop after an accident, 36 months in the higher form of torture for women, those will run consecutive to each other. Your driver's license is suspended for life. You're also assessed six points on your driver's license. I have considered everything in this matter. Your jail time credit will be uh, applied to your sentence. Document indicates three days jail time credit. You're responsible for your costs before you may be required to do community work service. You do have a right to appeal your sentence, this sentence, uh, and your convictions. If you are indigent, let the court know within 30 days, I'll provide a transcript and an attorney at state's expense. Post release control uh, is mandatory part of the sentence for this felony of the third degree. It's three years mandatory post release control. Uh, upon your release, you will be supervised by the Ohio Adult Parole Authority for three years. You must follow the rules of the parole authority. If you fail to follow their rules, they have the power to send you back to prison for a total of up to 50% of this eight year sentence. Any violation of the parole authority's rules could result in a residential sanction, which could include an imprisoned term up to nine months. The rules on post release control will require you to report to a parole officer. If you fail to report, the parole authority can punish you by sending you back to prison. You're also subject to being indicted on a separate felony called escape. That means the judge assigned to the new indictment could also punish you with time in prison, even if the parole authority punished you for the same thing for not reporting the prison term. That's true of any other felony you might commit on post release control. If you are convicted of a felony when you're on post release control, sentencing court will have an option to impose a consecutive prison term for the amount of time remaining on post release control or 12 months, whichever is greater. Uh, for the record, this is a class two driver's license suspension. Is there anything else the court needs to put on the record, Ms. Bradley? No, not on behalf of the state, Your Honor. Thank you. you. Anything else, Sean? Is no, Your Honor. Thank you. All right. That's your manner.